one of the world-leading experts in the science of subconscious learning, motivation, and communication, speaking on change without thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, here I presenting you, Dr. Eldon Taylor. I'm very honored to be here today. I have to begin this morning by telling you a little bit about myself and what we're going to do. We have a very large agenda. In order to do that, understand what subliminal communication is, understand how the subconscious mind works, and boy, that one all by itself is an enormous task. Understand how we can empower ourselves and understand how we rob ourselves of power on a daily basis. I'm going to do it this way. We're going to start by building a puzzle. I don't know how many of you like puzzles or ever worked with puzzles, but the most unique one I ever saw, you had to build the puzzle parts. And then you assembled those parts into a larger puzzle. In a sense, that's what we have to do today. We have to take each of these constructs that universities can spend one and two years teaching, and we have to condense that, construct that little puzzle piece, and do so in a way that all of you understand. Then build all the other little pieces, and then tie them together. So if you'll bear with me, there may be points where it looks like we have gone off on a tangent. But it's really not a tangent. It is a piece of the puzzle that we'll bring back and we'll assemble, we'll put together. Thirty years ago, I was still compensating for a lot of things that I'd experienced as a child. And I hope by the time today's over, you're going to be able to look at yourself and see, perhaps, limitations you self-imposed that for all intent and purposes were compensation mechanisms that you developed as a young person. And those mechanisms may have served you as that young person. That is, they may have been adaptive. They avoided conflict. They, they avoided stress. They brought attention. But in your adult life, you discover that many of them are maladaptive. That is, they're hidden away in our unconscious, and we have a stated outward desire. And our stated outward desire and our unconscious are incongruent. They don't fit together. So we may say, I'm going to do this, but we say that, and we say it, and we say it, and all time just ticks away. We never quite get it done. Now, sometimes that's a, a little change. I know a, a gentleman that is a very successful athlete, and I've had the opportunity to work with some of the finest athletes in the world. This athlete is someone that everyone on the planet admires, but he has one failing. In his words, he exaggerates. So he has a tendency to embellish experiences he's really done, and maybe to make up one or two he hasn't. And he finds it embarrassing because in the press, in the limelight, there's no room for that. But to him, the most important thing is his children. His three children that say, Dad, that's not true. Why'd you say that? He finds that humiliating, as we all would. So I think we can look at the greatest people in all fields and find that those, each and every one of them, have something they want to change. Thirty years ago, as I said, I was compensating. What does that mean? Well, when I was a child, like most children in America, I was raised under what we call a no-don't syndrome. No, you can't do this. You're not old enough for that. You're too stupid for this. Indeed, I tell you something. My wife was born in New Delhi. I met her in London, England, lecturing at the National College, fell in love, got married, 
And one day my wife was saying, because I'm a perennial student, I'm always studying something somewhere from somebody. My wife said to me, when is enough going to be enough? I said, what do you mean by that? She said, well, you know, honey, I've heard you talk. And you were raised to think you'd never be smart enough. Has it occurred to you that maybe all this education is how you're compensating to be smart enough? You know what? You're right. You're right. There's a time and a place to just quit and say, okay, you're right. I, I really don't need to do that anymore. If the world thinks I'm stupid, they're going to think I'm stupid. And it doesn't matter how much I do to make up for that. There comes a point where you have to let go of these compensations. I was using my education to practice criminalistics. Criminalistics is a function of law enforcement. It differs from criminology, the theory that is taught in sociology, because in criminalistics, I will actually run a lie detection examination. I'll conduct an interrogation. I'll conduct a forensic hypnosis examination. I'll testify in a court of law as a hands-on case developer, etc. Well, my father had come out of the Second World War, drill instructor, and gone directly into law enforcement. I had a good background in that because of my dad. My father had also, my father and mother, had told me, like I tell my 12-year-old son, you could be a good attorney because whenever they'd say anything, I'd try and manipulate that to gain some advantage. And so they were always saying, you should be an attorney when you grow up. So I'd thought about that. And when I first went to college, I intended to be an attorney. I took the LSAT, the law school admission examination, scored in the top 3% of the nation. So I'm a young guy. I've got everything going for me. And then I discovered that I had a moral conflict with being an attorney. Not that there's anything wrong with being attorneys. And I'm sure we have some here today. but. I didn't want to practice corporate law and be tied to a desk. I was thinking of criminal law. And my heroes were all criminal lawyers. But they were getting guilty people off on technicalities. There's a very famous case in the United States where exactly that happened and the person recommitted another very serious crime. And there was a part of me that said, I can't do this. I just simply can't do that. That doesn't fit with who I am. But you see, I'd always been kind of a superstitious kid because I came from this background that all these mixed blood. My father had Native American in him, and I got Native American shamanism, and he converted to one church and my mother to another church, but her family, they had Masonic backgrounds and mysticism and Kabbalah. It was just amazed by how the mind worked and what life was, and all these mystical traditions. So if I couldn't study law, well, you know, I'll study the mind. I'll study what makes the mind work, because I always had a passion for that. When I was a boy, 17 years old, I was taking a beautiful young lady to a dance, driving it. I'm going to date myself now, a 1954 Oldsmobile, and I rolled up onto these railroad tracks. And as I did, the car stalled. And like it was a cue in a movie, arms started to come down, bells started to ring, lights started to flash. There was a train coming. I looked down the railroad track, and this train just seemed to be almost on us. And the girl I was with, Connie Despain, said to me, should we get out of the car? And the only thought that was in my mind was, if we try to, we'll get caught and the car will get drug over us. So let me try and start the car. So I said, no, sit still, sit still. And that train hit that car. It turned out, and there was a case out of this, but it turned out that this train had over a hundred cars behind it and was doing nearly a hundred miles an hour. It hit the car that I was driving on the driver's side. I remember seeing that train and I remember trying to start that car. 
And the next memory I have, I'm standing in a field. And I'm looking over at all these emergency vehicles. Their lights are flashing. Where's Connie? Well, Connie has been trapped in the car. Some time has passed because they've cut her out of the car. The car is smashed on the driver's side. And, and, and I mean the whole car is not that high. And I'm standing in this field. I identify myself because everybody wants to know who I am. I'm the guy that was driving a car. Connie would tell you she had her hand on my leg while I tried to start this car. She will also tell you she did in a court of law, as I did in a court of law, as they went through this lawsuit against the railroad company, that I was in that car when that train hit it. And then I'm in a field, and I'm untouched, unscathed. But the car has been so smashed, they've had to cut her out. And while they're cutting her out, they're, she's asking them, where's Eldon? Where's Eldon? And she thinks I'm, they're going to have to cut me out next. To this day, I have some colleagues that will say things like, ah, oh, you know, there's no such thing as paranormal. This psychic stuff is all nonsense. You know, look, you're born, you die, ashes to ashes, that's the end of it all. And I can tell you that in my lifetime, as I've studied both science and as I've, I've experienced life, I know that's false. This is simply false. There is no explanation for how I got from that car to that field. So there is some other grander something going on. And perhaps that happened to me so that I would find my way to where I am today. Not in law enforcement, but doing exactly what I'm doing, talking to you here today. And today I'm going to talk to you not just about the science of mind, but we're going to talk about the unconscious. And when you talk about the unconscious, you have to talk ultimately about the phenomena of consciousness. And the phenomena of consciousness includes everything from a simple ah to these so-called inescapable unexplainable white crows. And I use that in the sense William James used it. William James said, great philosopher, psychologist in American history, you know, if science has an axiom, and the axiom is all crows are black, then you only have to find one white crow to know that that axiom is false. Well, we're going to talk about a lot of white crows, not to generate any falsehood, but to open up the way we think about consciousness. All right, so here I am 30 years ago in a nutshell, and I have an agency, and that agency runs investigations for public and private sectors, and we run a lot of lie detection tests. And that's because we have a new instrument. It's called a psychological stress evaluator, developed by a couple of bird colonels and military intelligence for covert applications, which means I can simply take a recording. Now, don't confuse this with voice analysis. It has nothing to do with voice analysis. Take a, a, a recording and then examine that recording and determine if there's distress involved in the statements. Well, all a lie detector, polygraph, or otherwise does is measure physiological feedback. And when we see distress in structured examinations, relevant questions, and it's there clear, but it's not in irrelevance and control questions, then we call that a deception-indicated test. Well, psychological evaluation works by looking at a muscle microtremor between 6 and 14 cycles per second that accompanies all voluntary muscle movement, including speaking. So when I speak, assuming that I'm not under too much stress, the sympathetic and parasympathetic portions of my autonomic nervous system 
talk to one another in what is known as a muscle micro tremor. Now, if I become distressed, one will fire and begin to fill my system with adrenaline. I'll behave in a fight flight way. And when that happens, this micro tremor disappears. Now, the reason I tell you about this is because when it disappears, we'd see rectally linear patterns on a chart. And since we'd take all these recordings, I'd sit at a little ooh hair recorder that recorded at seven and a half inches per second, but it could be slowed down to 15 sixteenths of an inch per second and run their answers, just their answers, through this PSE. Well, one day I was doing that, and as I backed up the answer, make sure I had the right needle height as we marked it, what I heard astounded me. But what I heard was this, liar. Played it forward, it was a simple answer, no. Backwards, liar. And you know what? The chart said this person was lying. And you know what else? They later confessed. And we made a physical recovery. So we knew the confession was valid. Now, because of the technology we had, and because of my interest in trying to be smart enough, 30 years ago, I had a career. It was a prosperous career. I was happy in that career, I thought. And I was also getting a lot of notoriety, hearing the different media for some of the things that we did. But the universe didn't have that in mind for me. Instead, it put a couple of things in my face that really distressed me. I began to have trouble sleeping. And I began to have experiences, dreams, and things that nagged at me. And I felt incomplete. I felt like what I was doing didn't really matter. I felt like what I was doing was kind of that much of what you might do with your life. And while this was going on, I happened to come across, still involved in law enforcement, this article it insisted that the Los Angeles Police Department during the 1982 Olympics had experimented with subliminal communication. They had created a terrorist abduction scenario, and in this scenario, they were going to use subliminal information processing to dehydrate terrorists. How are you going to do that? But what I heard was they tried it out on cadets in the academy and they suspended it after three days because they had effectively dehydrated too many cadets. So I set about trying to verify this. Well, I couldn't get it denied and I couldn't get it verified to this day. But something in me said, wow. You know, if I could get my hands on a technology like that, do you know I would soar to the very top of my profession? And why is that? Well, anyone that runs lie detection tests know that you're going to have a percentage that we call inconclusive. Detectives hate that. Lie detection examiners hate it. Because what it amounts to is you have somebody that is using countermeasures to manipulate an outcome, or you have someone that is stressed, too stressed for the situation, and their situational stress bleeds into all the questions. So when you're done, you've got stress everywhere. You can't say they're telling you the truth, but you can't say it's deception indicated. Now, if you could do away with inconclusives, wow. You know, wow, that'd be a magic bullet. So I set out to learn about subliminal communication. Now, there were some people that were selling some programs, subliminal programs. And so the first thing I did was get on the phone and call them. How do you make your subliminal programs? You thought I was asking for the recipe for Coca-Cola. 
there wasn't anybody that would talk to me about that. It was secret, it was this, it was that. Now they were making all kinds of claims. You see, in science, if you make a claim, you better be able to verify that claim. That's part of science. So in other words, if you say, I can do this and I did it this way, somebody else should be able to use that exact way and replicate what your findings were. And if they're unable to do that, well then, that's not science. But all these people I talked to, it was a secret recipe. Access to how they did anything that they did was not possible. I'm an investigator. So I sent people out to buy everything that was in the marketplace. Because there were people making tapes, and they were saying, you know, this subliminal tape will fix everything. Okay, go out there and buy them. Now this is early in the 80s. This is an industry that is just building. And it's building off of a controversy that we'll talk about in a minute. But I sent them all out to find these tapes. They bought them, they brought them in and I sent them to audio forensic laboratories in Los Angeles. Anthony Pelicano, the top guy. You know, because what Anthony will do, he'll take them apart and he'll tell me exactly what they did. So much for their Coca-Cola recipe. Well, I got Anthony on the phone not long after that. Eldon, I can't find anything on any of these tapes. Well, what do you mean you can't find anything? Well, there's nothing here. You know, I mean, there's music, there's ocean, there's nothing here. Some of them don't have anything. You know, they're silent subliminals, really silent. <laughs> that can't be. Okay, if I can't do it that way, off to the University of Utah I go. Now, these are the days that Pasquale and Cobalt compilers are the way you run computers and you have mosaic and so you have a librarian that does all that stuff you know you don't go in and sit down like you do today and just access the internet and navigate anywhere you want and not worry about getting lost not worry about not getting home I mean my son who is a savant with computers at 12 years of age can't even understand what I try to explain to him when I tell him about mosaic I guess that makes me a dinosaur I go to the librarian and I say, get me everything you can get me on subliminal information processing. I want to see all the research, all the data. You know, so go out there, search the term, and come back with an abstract. And then I can decide what papers I want. She does. It's very good. In those days, you paid for it. Well, it was a lot of money. So I start digging through these abstracts, and then from the abstracts, getting the full papers. I can't find any literature on subliminal research that supports audio application. There is a lot of research on visual, but not on audio. There's no research, people selling tapes, they can't find any messages on them. I mean, this is all wrong. But there was a part of me that wouldn't allow myself to just quit there. So instead, I started devising methods for how you could create what today is what we call our patented intertalk method. Now, if you have the technology and you're going to put words there and you want people to, you know, relax if they came to tell you the truth and you really want to build their, their stress level if they came to lie to you, what do you say to them? What do you say? We settled on the truth shall set you free, and that's what we used. We started playing these programs. Suspect would come in, they'd be seated, stark room, 45 minutes, they fill out forms and wait. And we played nonstop. The forms are processed out, 30 more minutes, they wait. We played the messages. Come in, they take the test. Gosh, you know what? Inconclusives really disappeared. But the worst part of all this, see, my agency got paid by the hour. 
The confession rate in the first hour went through the roof. Well, there's a part of me that wanted to say, hey, look, don't tell me yet, will you? I get paid by the hour. I was amazed. I was really astounded. So I started sharing this with some of my colleagues at agencies, and they started to, to use it. In South Africa, they utilized the programs for interrogation. A friend of mine in South Africa got a hold of me and said, Eldon, you know, interrogation down here is done this way. Beat them once, if they don't tell you. Beat them harder the next time, and if they don't tell you, well, beat them again. And so they had a lot of confessions, but the confessions often didn't mean anything. They were just, look, you know, don't beat me anymore. I'll tell you anything I want to tell you. So we sent programs into there, and this is a true story. I get a phone call like 2 a.m. in the morning, three, four months down the road. Air us out another tape. Ours broke. They became that dependent on using these tapes in their interrogation techniques. They were that effective. I have this technology, and it's working. I have nagging at me this need to do something else with my life. And I don't even understand it. I just know that outwardly I look really successful. My personal life is a wreck. But who cares? I'm too busy for that anyway. I had friends that said to me,